to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to you. What you're listening to is a micro episode to kick off the month of very cool guests all talking about something that has dominated the headlines in recent months, conspiracy theories and fact denial. Yeah, conspiracy theories have captured our attention for a long time. Like, why do people believe that the trails of moisture that follow jet engines at very high altitudes are showering the earth with chemicals that control our behavior? And why do some people believe that the earth is truly flat? Or why do some believe that COVID vaccines include microchips to track our bodily functions? Well, you get the idea. All of these theories have been debunked, and yet people keep on believing. Well. Have they really been debunked, Tim? I mean, <laughs> that could all just be fake news, and the 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 masters of the 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 you know universe are are conspiring against us. But no, yes, they have been debunked, and they yes, have. they yes. they do. And so this month we've got four fantastic episodes uh, teed up to tickle your behavioral science buttons on the topic of corrupted cognitive processing. So, Tim, whose work are we highlighting this month? Well, on November 7th, we're going to feature Lee McIntyre in a discussion about his new book, How to Talk to a Science Denier. He's a philosophy professor, and he actually went to a flat earth convention and engaged a variety of people in conversations. It's an amazing book and an amazing conversation that we had with him. Who, who's going to be next, Kurt? Well, one of Lee's buddies is another philosophy professor, and his name is Andy Norman. Andy's new book is called Mental Immunity, and we found it fascinating as a way to get away from the popular belief that everything is relative. And Andy argues that there are some facts that are just that. Facts. Facts, Tim. Believe them. They're true. <laughs> right. They are there without whether you believe them or not. I believe. It's just, it's, I believe. They, they, it's our facts. That's what facts are. God damn it. All right, Tim, what's next? Uh, well, we're going to republish a discussion that we had with Eric Oliver, who is a political science professor at the University of Chicago, and he has studied conspiracy theories for 20 years. He claims that roughly 50% of the population, and I think that that's mostly U.S., by the way, believes in some kind of conspiracy theory. Most importantly, he explains the psychology behind why we believe conspiracy theories in the first place, and that leaves us with... That one of us believes in conspiracy theories because of fifty percent. There's two of us, and Good. I'm thinking I know who it is. I think I know. I think you do. I'm... All right. Do? No. 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 The, the the last week of of November, we'll have Howard Rankin, who has a new book called "I Think Therefore I Am Wrong." We talked to Howard about how our thinking can go astray, and he provides some great examples that you won't want to miss. But let's get started with one of our favorite guests of all time right now. Let's start with that. Absolutely, Kurt. Let's do. So before we head into this clip, we have a couple of things to note. And the first thing is to express our gratitude to our research associate, Mary Califf. Mary is a tireless contributor to Behavioral Grooves with great research on our guests. She provides production support to make sure that every episode gets released with the show notes that people can understand and or on time every single week, and she markets the living daylights out of each episode to help more and more people find out about our passion. So thank you to Mary for coming up with this idea and for developing the foundation for, for, the, for the entire month. She is a terrific partner, and we thank her. We sure do, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We also want to ask you to subscribe to Behavioral Grooves. Hey, guess what? It's free, and that Woo. is a fact. That is that a is fact? A fact I, I heard that was a conspiracy. You, th you heard? Yeah, this. that, that we're, we're yeah. actually taking pennies out of everybody's pay, paycheck every, uh, out of, every out month. Of, every yeah. free subscription actually puts money in our pocket. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if only. If only that was true. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, anyway um, and if you haven't had a chance to leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast that service that you listen to, please do so today doesn't take but a minute and it goes a long long way in helping other people find out about behavioral grooves and if you don't have the time for a review just jump over to our behavioral grooves com dot page and sign up for our newsletter you get some really cool stuff with that newsletter so please go ahead and do that 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, back to our guest for this mini micro episode. And Shankar Vedantam is the host of one of our favorite podcasts, Hidden Brain. And we talked about his newest book, Useful Delusions, recently. And in that discussion, he brought up the less than perfect way we hold on to things that are really just part of our imagination, like our country or our nation. Exactly, Tim. But it is also really dangerous ideas, like the way people stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. So we're going to listen to a short clip from our conversation with Shankar to help us tee up our month of conspiracy theories. And hold on to Shankar's words if you want to speak to someone who's a classic science denier. Get them to explain why their theory is correct. You know, most of us, I think, find it difficult to think of nations as delusions. Uh, we think uh, the nation seems like it's a real construct. But if you define a delusion as something that's principally the invention of the human mind, an invention of the human mind, that depends for its existence on the human mind, it has no reality outside of the human mind, uh, and also believes and also depends in some cases on large numbers of people believing the same thing, you see that the nation checks all those boxes. Nations, in fact, are inventions of the human mind. They have no reality reality apart from the human mind. If humans were to disappear from the planet tomorrow, there would be no more nations instantly. And of course, the reality of what constitutes the United States and what constitutes Mexico and what constitutes Canada depends on the beliefs of the people living in the United States and Mexico and Canada. There's a shared agreement that sort of says, here's where the United States ends and here's where Mexico begins, or here's where the United States ends and here's where Canada begins. Now, the, the United States is in some ways a delusion, but I would argue it's a very useful delusion because as a nation, we're able to do many things together that we would not be able to do on our own. So, for example, if there are parts of the country that are doing very well, those parts of the country, you can send resources and help to parts of the country that are not doing so well. If there is a natural disaster in Texas, somebody in New York feels, you know, I need to help the person in Texas. Why do you feel like you need to help the person in Texas? You're never going to meet them. You're not related to them. There's no connection with them. Well, you feel like helping them because you say, well, we're both Americans. We have a shared identity. And so the nation basically is a useful construct to create this shared umbrella of beliefs and values and norms that allow large numbers of people to work cohesively together, allows us to accomplish great things. Now, again, as I said, only a quick glance at the history of the last 100 years can show you all the terrible things that nations have done, all the genocides and wars that nations have brought about. So you can very easily make the argument that, you know, nations, the delusions that we have about nations can produce great harm. But I would argue that that's an example of something in our daily lives where my life would probably be worse off if all of us did not believe in the existence and reality of the country in which we live. The problem, I think, with some deception, some, some self-delusions is when my beliefs affect you. So in other mm. words, if I believe, for example, that, that people who have your skin color or your age group or your religion, that there's something wrong with you, now my self-deceptions are not just affecting my subjective experience of the world. They're, expect, they're affecting you. They're affecting how I treat you. They're affecting how I behave towards you. In many ways, I think we should focus much of our attention on self-deception and delusion on areas of our lives that impinge on other people. Because I think it's where they impinge on other people, especially where my delusions, my self-deceptions harm you, that's where the delusion becomes dangerous. I think it's where it tips from benefit to harm that I think that the, the tipping point has, it, that's the, that might be the dividing line between where self-deception is a feature to where it becomes a bug. I can't help but think about uh, the the QAnon and the well the, the raid on the Capitol on January sixth as being sort of a a, a group delusion, uh, right? And uh, a, a whole bunch of subscriptions to uh, to self delusions coming to play in with large crowds, and. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not sure what the question is, but I, I, I'm. You live in the Washington D.C. area. How how difficult is this for you to kind of on a, on a daily basis to to sort of be aware of and be sensitive and and try to keep your life in order with with things like that going on. Yeah, I, January 6th was a truly wild day in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I think we all saw things on our television screens that I don't think any of us ever expected to see in our lifetimes. Um, and, and conspiracy theories, I think, are a sort of special case of self-deception, which I think, mm. you know, they can easily tip over into things that are deeply harmful. Um, you know, so I, let me say two things. One, I have sort of a, an, an interesting way sort of to combat conspiracy theories. But, but before oh. I get to that, let me just say one thing before that. 
you know, it is absolutely the case that the people who marched on the Capitol, the insurrectionists on January 6th, that they believed something that was delusional. I think that is true. But I think if you step back and look at it from a slightly larger perspective, if the nation itself is a delusion, if the nation itself involves acts of self-deception, you know, it is the case that I think the people who believed that the election was was flawed or was not correct were suffering from a delusion. But in some ways, what we're describing here is sort of a battle of different kinds of delusions, right? In mm. other words, if yeah. you had sort of someone visiting from another galaxy for a, se- for a second, just imagine that you had an anthropologist who comes to us from a distant galaxy, travels across millions of miles of empty space to arrive at this little tiny speck of a planet and finds that this one species on the planet, one species out of 8 million species on the planet, believes that it is so dominant that it has divided the planet into 190 different territories <laughs> and believes in these territories so deeply and so passionately that they've armed themselves with nuclear weapons and are willing to destroy themselves and the entire planet over the integrity of these 190 different lines in the sand. Surely this anthropologist from another galaxy would describe our relationship to our countries as delusional. And they would say these are (laughs) profound delusions that are potentially going to cause great harm. So that's the larger context. I think in some ways, you know, it's easy for us to basically sit in judgment of people who have self-deceptions. But I think very often it's very hard for us to perceive the things that hold our own lives together that in fact are also self-deceptions, that are also delusions. Uh, I will say, though, that when you look at delusions that are dangerous— The mistake that I think we often make is to try and confront those delusions with logic and reason. Um, Mm. I remember some years ago, I was having dinner with a friend of mine whom I'd uh, known in my college days, and he was firmly convinced that the United States was behind the 9-11 attacks, that the FBI and CIA had carried out the 9-11 attacks. And I remember arguing with him for 90 minutes over dinner, and at the end of that, you know, I hadn't convinced him. If anything, he was even more fervent in his belief that the United States was behind the attack, and perhaps our friendship had frayed a little. And I think if I was to do it over differently, I would do it, I would approach that conversation differently. Instead of telling him that he was an idiot and a moron and trying to throw logic at him, I would ask him many more questions. I would ask him how he came to the belief that he has. I would ask him how he knows what he knows. I would in some ways ask him to explain his belief to me. Um, Psychologists sometimes call, have an interesting... um, I've come up with this interesting idea of something called the illusion of explanatory depth. And the illusion of explanatory depth is that we all believe we can explain the world better than we can actually explain the world. So, for example, if I were to ask you, how do your glasses work or how does your microphone work? You know, we might come up with, we might say, yeah, I sort of broadly understand how my glasses works. And we say, okay, fine, just draw a pair of glasses for me or, you know, draw a microphone for me or draw a bicycle for me. And it turns out when you ask people to actually demonstrate their knowledge, people should sort of quickly realize that they actually know much less about the world than they actually do. This is called the illusion of explanatory depth. And one of the values of asking people questions where in some ways they are answering and revealing what it is that they know is that it starts to put a seed of doubt in their own minds about the certainty they have of their own beliefs. I think when it comes to conspiracy theories, many of us believe that the challenge is to persuade other people about the error of their beliefs. I think the real challenge when it comes to conspiracy beliefs is to get people to challenge their own beliefs. Mm. The process actually has to begin from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And I think you're more likely to start that process by starting with not just questions, but a certain amount of compassion and empathy to basically ask, how is it possible that this conspiracy theory is actually performing some kind of valuable function in your life? Let me try and understand it from your point of view. Kurt, I don't think that there's a lot to say here because Shankar pretty much already did it and he did it really well. Agreed. But we want to remind listeners that this is the first in this series. So the entire month of November is going to be dedicated to our mental fitness and how we can push back against bad ideas and conspiratorial thinking and all of those crazy lunatic uncles that we all, all have. And by the way, it's true. They are always our uncles. They're there are always our crazy uncles, yeah. They're There's always the crazy uncles. Yeah. No one else uh, agreed. And so, Groovers, we hope that you enjoy the series for the rest of the month and that this week you go out and find your groove. Mm-hmm.